Welcome to this free pixel art beginners course. During this fully comprehensive 3 hour tutorial, you will be learning all the basics of making great pixel art. If you would like to know everything there is to know about pixel art, check us out on skillademia.com and get access to the full course. Now let's begin. Hello and welcome to my course on creating pixel art. In this course, I will cover my entire knowledge of the subject, all the way from the absolute basics to the expert level techniques. My name is Mike Marshall. I have worked in the pixel art industry for the last four years, working as a freelancer and on some small indie games, and now I'd like to pass on some of that knowledge. Pixel art is a really interesting art style. Because we are limited by space, available colours and canvas size, the work we produce is visually distinct from many other contemporary styles. In a similar way to pointillism, we put down dots of colour, called pixels, which will come together to form an image. Another ancient example that can be compared to pixel art are things such as mosaics and stained glass works. Glass and stone arranged into patterns create a larger image. This style of art goes back thousands of years. Cross stitching and tapestries are another similar example, as the individual stitches come together to form an image. Pixel art as we know it, however, originates in the late 20th century with the advent of computer games. The first, most widely known example is Pong. As technology was limited, we have just a few white bars and dots on a black background, as this was the limit of the technology of the time. This was followed half a decade later by Space Invaders. Like so. Obviously this is a similar example that I've recreated. Here you can see the upgrading technology allowed for more detailed sprites. You can see that this uh, Space Invader is about 16 by 16 pixels and also allowed the use of some colour. So black background, white enemies, and then green your character and your defences in this case. Technology and pixel art styles developed over the decades, leading to styles similar to things like Street Fighter, following the success of Street Fighter 2, and other cute styles like Pokemon in the 90s. So, for example, this is something I made which is in a similar style to Street Fighter 2 or 3, so this sort of um, 100 by 100 kind of style sized sprite, or something similar to like more classic Pokemon, like red and blue, but obviously uh, more colours than they originally allowed in the early games. But so these are two modern, more modern styles taking inspiration from those classic games. Some people really like pixel art for the feeling of nostalgia that it gives them from their youth. However. Even with younger adults and children liking the style, I feel that it shows it has its own distinct style that will stand its own for decades to come. And as we've seen from many new games being made, the styles have branched off a lot from the older games to more distinct styles today. So it's definitely got a place for pixel art to go in the future, which is very promising. So you may be wondering what software you can use to create pixel art. We'll have a look at some of these options available to you in the section ahead, right now. Okay, so let's start with looking at how we can start making some pixel art. You might think, oh, I can just draw some curves, or I can just draw some straight lines. That's slightly more difficult with how pixel art works, because we are drawing on the smallest possible scale. So, if we draw a straight line, that doesn't look perfect, does it? Even if we use the tool to make a straight line, it doesn't go up in a uniform or pleasing way. See, the little bits that go up in twos, some that go up in ones. Same for if we do a curve. We won't ever get a really nice looking curve. So this is where some difficulties can come with pixel art. It just requires a lot of practice. So we have a few different types of line we'll tend to use. We'll either use, go up in single dots like that. So one up, one across and that'll make a nice 45 degree line going upwards. Obviously, straight up and straight down make no problem at all for us. They're the easiest type of lines we can do in pixel art. So I said it was a 45 degree, and then we can go two across and one up, two across, one up, like this. This is another type of straight line we can do. 
I'll go three across, one up, which will be three, 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 three. And like that. Or, as you might have realised not by now, we can also do, as we said, four across. One up. So, and you can always increase about how far you go across, and still go by one. That'll give you a different steepness, a different gradient of line. You can do the same thing going upwards. Go two up, one across. Like so. It'll give us a more steep line than the 45 degree one across one up. Or three up, one across, like that. And four up, one across. That's five. Okay, it just comes with practice. And this is basically how we can get straight lines. If we want to show a curve, it can be a bit trickier. So for example, something like this, we've got lots of things at different lengths, at different um, amounts going across, so look uneven. We want to combine all these types of lines. So for example, I could go like this, change how thick it's going, and I've got a kind of a more gentle S shape. And that's because in between these long parts, obviously if we just did the long parts without these single dots there, it would look more like a severe turn. But by adding in a couple of single line parts, it makes it a smoother turn. So when we're doing curves, we want to transition into these turns. So it looks more gradual. So if we did just wing it and draw something like this, we could probably make it look somewhat smooth by just changing. So there's a three, a two, a two, pull those into ones, two down, two down, three down, four down, and have it repeat. So that's a little bit more smooth than what we started with back there. Just smooths it all out. Again, this can be a tricky thing with pixel art, especially um, showing circles at really small scales. The bigger a circle is, the smoother it can look. But on a small scale, getting curves can be the most difficult thing. Uh, so kind of sometimes got to exaggerate features to make it work a little bit better. So that is the basics of lines. After lines, we can look at making some shapes. So for example, uh, let's make a new layer here. Let's go and we can do obviously a square really easy. Four straight lines. I guess a rectangle because it's not quite perfectly symmetrical. Circle is the tricky one as I said. So depending on the size, uh, circles sometimes have to be really abstracted. Because if for example, we can't do a circle, it, it, like if we did a circle on this le level, it's just a square. Slightly bigger and we can kind of do a circle like that or like that or just eventually just rounding out slightly more every time until you can get to something that's more circular looking. But as I said, circles are one of the hardest things to show looking really smooth in pixel art. So I'm going to do three, two, one, one, two, three, two, one, one, two, three, two, one, one, two, three, two. And that's probably in one of the better circle sizes you can have. That still looks fairly circular, but obviously still looks a bit bumpy and uh, prismy still. Looks a bit like a diamond still. I don't very much read that as like a diamond shape. But 
so, as I said, circles are difficult. It kind of has got to do what you can do. And with a triangle, I'd do a flat bottom and just take it up like so. Also, depending on how steep you want it to be. Where it meets will be the height. There's a little small based triangle. And of course, we can start combining these shapes or add third dimensions onto them to make more complex shapes. For example, we could um, make these 3D by adding in a little bit more detail like into it there. Let's just pop that in like that, keeping our straight lines. And now I've gone from a 2D square into a 3D cube. For a sphere, a circle, a 3D circle, you need to, you can only do that with shading. So we'll cover that when we get into more into the shading topic. And for a triangle, that'd be more of a pyramid shape. So we'll do the same thing we did for the cube. Just start taking it out into a third dimension, like so. Uh, maybe, how far should it be? Maybe that far? And then, kind of joining it back up at the top. Like, like that. Something like that will be like, or if we did a prism, uh, an actual pyramid, it's slightly trickier because we need to have it meet at the top. So a pyramid shape would be more like that. So now all, all the four points will converge at the same point. But again, um, this is, um, a lot of the 3D elements of pixel art will come in more in terms of when you are shading. So yeah, so that's the very basics of um, constructing lines and shapes in pixel art. And now in the next topic, we can start looking at how to develop this further and start making... In our last topic, we looked at the very basics of pixel art using lines to build up into simple shapes. Now we'll, we'll continue this further and start um, looking at how we can use these principles in an actual image. First of all, let's talk about one way we can make something look 3D other than just using our lines. So let's take our cube here. I'll just uh, make a, whoops, make sure I grab it correctly. There we go. And make a copy of it down here. So if I didn't want to have these black lines around it, I could fill it in with a color. Let's just stick with grayscale for now. Fill in that there, that there, that there. And as you can see, it's filled in these outside bits a little bit, which is a, could be a bit of a pain, but easily rubbed out. So now I've got a gray cube, but we still have this black outline. So what we can do is we can think about where the light source is coming from. So let's say in my example, the light source is coming from, let's say, up here somewhere like that. So the top of the cube will be lighter and the back of the cube will be darker. So let's get a dark color for the back of our cube. Something like this. Try and just fill in the whole side of it. Like so. Let's uh, keep this light color on top. And let's get a mid-tone, a color in between those two for the front. Let's go down to like here-ish, like so. So now, just by using different colors, obviously you can always take it in or out a bit, depending on how you want it to look. Like so. I don't want to put it like that. Like that maybe. Sometimes it doesn't always look just right because obviously sometimes the edges flop over a bit. For example, you could do a mid-tone like there just to make it 
There you go, yeah, that bridges the gap a little bit more. So now we've created a cube just using simple colors, different um, gradients of color. Um, so no lines evolved, just the blocks of shape, showing the direction that light is coming from and therefore the shape of the object. In our tutorial now, we can do this together. We can have the challenge of creating a pillar. So for example, think of like a Greek pillar they might see holding up a roof, for example. So I'll start with my black color and my single, single thickness brush. And let's just draw some lines going up to start with. Obviously it can be a little bit messy to start with, Obviously, does, how big you want it to be is up to you. So the bigger you do it, the more detail you can have. The smaller you do it, the more stylized it'll be. So I'm just going to do it in this sort of rough size. Take off some of it. Let's do it about here. I'm going to have a little bit on the top of my pillar. A little square bit. And... Let's have it so it goes in a little bit too. A little, little design feature like that. Then, so I'm not leave it. So I've just got the black outline like so, and this can be the floor. Well, see, it's very simple at this stage. Currently, it doesn't look like a pillar at all. If anything, it looks probably like a pipe from Mario. But we can add in some details to make it look more pillary. So, for example, Let's add in some more lines to show those lined textures that the pillar has. And sometimes like this, you'll find out that you've not done it evenly all the way across. When this happens, you can have to decide the light's coming from that way and the far bit is just the darkest, or take it one more further out, move the rest of the design out, and make your design a little, oops, a little bit bigger, like so. Now it's got that little wrinkled pillar texture. And now we can add in some shading, like we did with this cube, to make it look a bit more three-dimensional. Just applying that underneath a black layer. So I'll make a layer underneath my black lines and we'll just stick with black and white just for now. Color in underneath. I always get a bigger brush to do it a bit faster as well. Color in underneath all my black lines like so. And I can select this layer so that I can't draw anywhere else like that, I'm gonna draw underneath that. And I can try and show the curvature of this pillar. So let's just go down to, for example, the three hard brush. Imagine the light is still coming from the top right hand side, like with the cube, and basically just color it the same way. But imagine, instead of it's a block, it's a pillar. That will be lit from the right hand side. So just doing very simple three color tone. There we go. And now hopefully it should look a little bit more three dimensional. Obviously this is still very early, very simple stuff, but and obviously when you have more techniques, it'll be more detailed, but this could be the bare minimum for, for example, this probably looks more like um, an American garbage can from what I've seen in media when it's like this color. You could also always add in a bit of detail there. Supply with like a little divot maybe. Uh, you could all add a little bit of light on the backside because curved objects sometimes pick up a bit of light from behind stuff, some reflected light. Add in a bit of dark shadow underneath where the lip is, like that. All those little details to add a little bit to it. Even have our black maybe go a bit there like that. It's all just about combining all the techniques you'll learn over time 
to create a more cohesive image. Try on your own, try and make something like this, um, add in your own little fla flares and flourishes, try a bit of colour if you like, but we'll go over that more in the next section. Uh, just think about how the light would shine into it and how you can make it look more three-dimensional. You could do the same for this pyramid as well. Or, or you could even take off the black as well. You could do that as a different darker grey, for example. So we took this dark grey, put that to like a darker black, big brush. Now it's not black either, it's just a very dark grey. I preferred it with black though. Now I've got to leave that black. Sometimes you get to see what works and always go back. That's what the undo feature is great for in digital art. Likewise with this pyramid, we can do a similar thing to the, whoops, to the cube. Except this time it's slightly different because of this different shape. So we might have to imply some of it is catching different amounts of light. Maybe something like that. Just to imply that it's uh, all catching the light at different amounts. Now, as we said before, circles can be hard to draw, so can spheres. But same principle. So we'll take this midtone we've been using, make it on a new layer. I'm just going to draw over this one, draw over all of it, and like so. And I'll just fill that in. Make sure it doesn't go over any gaps. So we have a little 2B sphere. Take the darker tone. I'll select it as well so I can't draw outside of that layer. And again, I'm just imagining the light coming in from the top right hand side of the screen. So I'm going to just do curve, not read really too much about it right now. It's a general curve for the bottom and side of the sphere. Take the lighter colour, do the same to the other side. Something like that. And then kind of just play around with the colours and the gradients and the direction of the angles and try to get something that ends up working. I said it can just often be a little bit of trial and error. I don't like that so much, but I don't like the idea of it coming up a little bit there. Maybe like a little bit there. And we can always do like a little spot highlight as well. That often helps with spheres. Pure white, a little bit there. Is that perfect? Probably not. But sometimes it takes a little bit of working, fiddling to get it to look just right. A lot of times it's contextual as well. If we have a pattern of a football on here, or soccer ball if you're American, um, it could read better to be a ball. Adding on like those little shapes that make it look like a ball, for example. Something like that. So sometimes adding on additional details will help read as what shape it should be. But circles, spheres can be difficult to do in pixel art if you don't um, abstract it a bit, especially when you get smaller and smaller. So yeah, so this is the um, introduction to shading and creating 3D shapes. This knowledge here will carry on for most of the other designs we make in some way or another. Because if you think about it, um, most bodies or weapons or buildings are some combination of these shapes together. For example, we could have a quick, quick sketch of a head or a person like that. Very quick. Just uh, fill that in. Again, just using three colours. The more shades you use, the more detail you can put in. Some people like very, very limited palettes, some like quite large palettes. It's very much a personal preference. But we're going to start shading in some of the details. We'll see the head is 
kind of a combination between a cube and a sphere. Same for a torso. A lot of it is just the actual shapes coming together. Oops, I'm going to be rubber. See where the light's coming from. I tend to stick with top right corner, but it can be different for any image, uh, especially if you ha actually have the sun or a light source in the image. Then you'll want to change the light source to being from there. Got some very quick, just getting the general shapes in for the body. Obviously, the longer t time you spend on something, the more detail you put in, different colors, for example, you can get different effects. So as a proof of concept, using 3D uh, shading to make an image look more three-dimensional and give it some depth. Now as a challenge, let's take what we did before and try and make an apple. For now, we'll still stick using the uh, black and white grayscale tones and just try to turn basically what we had before as a sphere into an apple. So let's even, let's just uh, make some space and do it on this one actually. So let's move some of these around a little first, make some space. And obviously you follow along with me or try to do it after the fact and let's see what we can make together. Just shuffle some bits around, okay. So whether you just want to use, um, whether you want to have a, a black outline or not, it's entirely personal preference. Some people absolutely love it. I like it in some stuff. I don't like it in other stuff. Entirely depends on the size and the aesthetic you're going for. But I find it helps to start with a black outline and then get rid of it or keep it up to your preference. So I'm just going to start out by drawing a rough apple shape. So you can always start out rough and then add in more detail after the fact or, or rub it out as well. I think that's a general shape. And now I'll start by smoothing out the edge. This is the technique we talked about before. So I'm increasing the steepness of the lines gradually to make it look curved. But no sudden changes, go from a 2 to a 1 to a 1, to a 2, to a 2, to a 3, to a long bit. Again, with it, over time, you'll just kind of get an instinct for how you should do a curve. And some things want to be uniform, so the same on both sides, some not so much. So it's an organic form, so sometimes a little bit of variation can make it more visually interesting. Okay, and let's get rid of all of this extra detail. And let's have the little stalk bit like that. Play a bit shorter. That's something like that, isn't it? Okay, and now let's fill it in our midtone. On this software, I've got to fill in the edges before I can do the fill tool, just because of how it reads where the gaps are. It can be a bit of a pain, but obviously depending on what software you're using, there'll be some advantages, some disadvantages. This is one for Procreate. Like so, and now I can just fill. There we go. So in this case, I think I'm going to keep the black lines as the darkest side. So I'm going to get rid of the black lines, except for on the left hand side. And for the stalk, I'll have this, this stalk bit be black too. So in this case, I'm using the black as kind of like a fourth colour, as the very darkest bit. Now let's go with the next darkest. Now I'm just going to kind of just wing it for now. Just add in some kind of a big curve like this. And oop, oh, need to fill in that gap like that. We 
again, it's one of those things where just keep trying little bits, keep chipping away at it till you get something you're happy with. Add a little divot bit where the stalk sits in. Something like that. Now I might even do it like that a little bit. Now we have the black on the very bottom. Like that. Now let's get our lightest tone. Obviously, the more tones you use, the easier it is to get some more accurate shading. So we're kind of limiting ourselves here to just V3 and black. Can make it a little bit more difficult, but sometimes it's good practice on using a few tones. Because often in Pixlite, you'll only end up using three or four colors for like each section. So you might have like three skin colors or three reds, something like that. It'd be good practice using a few different tones. I might even get rid of this a little bit here. It was half as like a little bit of shine, maybe. Have some on the top of it as well. Catch light all along there. Maybe do some inside there as well. The light just catches the inside of where the stalk is. Maybe do a little bit on the stalk. Hmm. Maybe just a single line. So it's catching the light a little bit. feel like if I don't stop soon, I'll be here all day perfecting it. So I think, maybe I'll just take that down a bit there, a little under light there. Maybe neon this out a little bit. I think that's okay to leave it that step. But obviously now we can, this is just in black and white. But the next step i will be moving on to now, um, we can take what we've done in this stage and start adding some color to it. Looking at how we can use color, texture, stuff like that to build up a image into a more complete thing. Awesome. See you there. So you might be thinking about what software you can use to start creating your own pixel art. Personally, I use this one, Procreate. There are some advantages and some disadvantages to all of them. But all of them will basically be able to produce the same level of art, just depending on different tools you have for different ones. Procreate is just on the iPad and there's an iPhone version too called Procreate Lite. This is what I use um, for all my artwork, because I do some pixel art and I do some non-pixel art. So it's good for if you're an artist who does different types of work. So you kind of jump between both very easily. It's quite intuitive. And on my iPad, it's portable, so I can take it out anywhere I need to go. So I'll usually draw on this with either my Apple Pencil or usually my fingers, depending on what I'm doing specifically. And this is what I'll be using for the rest of this tutorial as well. So, how do you download Procreate? Simple. Go to the App Store. Procreate. And there it is. Procreate and Procreate Pocket, that's what it's called, for the iPhone. Procreate Pocket for the iPhone, regular Procreate for iPads. It won't show the price, so I already own it, but Googling it, it's currently at about £9, but there'll be often be sales or so on. But it's regular free updates, and 
it's very quality software as well. So I really enjoy using it. So that's why it's my main software. And there's not 100% pixel art integration. There's ways to get around any problems that it'll come across. So this is Procreate. As you can see, all my files I can put into different folders. So it's very helpful. Here is my main pixel art folder. We have lots of my commission work in it. So go on to a new page. Uh, this is what I've been using a bit before for this tutorial. We have all the layers in it. Layers, if you haven't used any um, art software before, is a way to separate images either above or below each other. You can either keep them separate or you can draw above or below something. So for example, I have this which I showed before, which I can just minus off so it won't get in the way of anything else we draw. Likewise, I can draw in, oops, I did get the right brush on. Uh, pixel art, let's go three. So I can draw in this on this layer, on the layer below it, if I change the color, I can draw underneath it, or layer above, I can draw on top of both. So layers can be extremely helpful whenever you're creating any type of art, just to keep things organized, so it's on different layers, it won't interact with each other. For example, on this layer, I can only rub out this layer that I'm on, and not the layers below it. Also, you can stack layers, and also layers are really helpful when it comes to animating something as well. Because when we turn on animation, so for in this case for Procreate, it's in this top left corner, actions, you have all your stuff, adding files, saving stuff, changing canvas size, and we'll have animation assist. Here, it turns each layer that we have into a frame, which we can play through to make an animation. Obviously, with our animations, we'll be usually having a character moving, something like that. So we'll have each frame of the animation on each layer. So layers are very important, and all the software I'll show you will have layers to some degree. So that's one thing you can do on Procreate. Uh, Procreate automatically doesn't come with any pixel art brushes as of time of me recording this. It just comes with all the regular painting brushes and ink brushes that you might see for normal drawing. So where I got my pixel art brushes is you can very, very easily download brushes from online, some free, some paid, and import those brushes onto your iPad. So to do this, I have an example I prepared. I downloaded some new retro brushes. So all you need to do, go into your brush library at the top here, and have all the folders for the different types of brushes. Go on to this new one I created, hit that plus button, import on the right hand side, top right hand side, click on that brush that I got, and it imports it in, oh there it is, and this is all the new brushes I downloaded. Obviously not pixel art, but useful stuff nonetheless. So obviously if you find a pixel art uh, brush set, just download it like that and then it works easily. One thing that might be a bit surprising though, depending on what um, brush sets you get, is this bar on the left hand side controls size, but not for these brushes. For these, I have my different sizes as brush types. So for example, my one pixel brush won't be affected at all by the size. That's because it basically how the brush works, it makes a stamp one pixel large. However, changing the opacity does change it. The opacity being how um, see-through something is. So that's the very basics of it. Obviously, we'll go over in more detail with this program specifically as we go through the course, because this is what I'll be using. Um, one downside of Procreate, which I found, uh, which is, as I said, it's not specifically made for pixel art, is, for example, if you 
draw something and you use this selection tool to say grab this part of it and move it apart you'll get these bits in between the pixels where Procreate doesn't know what to do to know if it wants to be black or white so it does the tones in between which can be a pain but you've just got to erase them and be careful of this. Minor problem but nothing we can't work with. Another thing that we you want to change straight away is um, when you click on this to select what the layer that you're on. On the bottom here you've got all the movement options and in this bottom corner here we have what says nearest. This wants to be our nearest neighbor for pixel art. This um, type of resizing option basically maintains hard edges. So if we make the pixel art bigger, it'll stay pixel art with some minor errors like this little bit here, but otherwise a little bit of a top didn't work perfectly. But generally that's way better than the other options. We can see when I change it. So by linear, we'll make it very blurry like so. So will by cubic. Like so. So nearest neighbor is by far the best one with some minor distortions on some of the edges. But we can work with that. Uh, so they're mainly the two things you want to watch out with watch out for with Procreate. Um, but in my opinion, the upsides way overpower the downsides, especially when you take into account how portable it is. In fact, I can do all my other art software on here. So if you're already an artist, you might already have this, um, very helpful. I like drawing with my finger. I find it really easy. Uh, some people prefer um, mouse and keyboard, but it's just personal preference at the end of the day. After you've cho been using your chosen input method for so long, you'll eventually just get used to that. So there's no right or wrong way to start. But that is Procreate in a nutshell. Okay, let's move on to the next type, which will be on the computer. <laughs> So for our second piece of software, we have Asprite. Unlike Procreate, Asprite is done entirely with mouse and keyboard. So unlike Procreate, we will use our Apple pencils or our fingers. Here, entirely mouse and keyboard control. So a computer software. You can find it on Asprite.org. You can get the full version or the trial version. And scroll down, see the cute interfaces, the cool style they're going for. Like see, you can get it for $20, a bit steeper, but very good pixel art program to use. That's all the features you'd ever need, basically. But if you're like me and you also play games on Steam, you can get it on there as well. So if we close this down, open up Steam, and we can search Xprite. There it is. And it is $15.49 in pounds on here. So probably similar price to the conversion from the website. And because I own it, I can just go on, use now. And as you can see, it's got a very cute style and all the text is already in pixel art, which is a really cool way of doing it. So we can go on file, new, and set up our canvas size, 200 by 200. Say what type of colors we'd want as in full color, black and white, or um, index, and what we want the background to be like, okay? And here we have it. So we can grab a black. Uh, zooming in and out is done with the control with the uh, mouse wheel. Control mouse wheel changes the size of the brush, so from small to big. Control click moves things around. Mouse wheel in allows you to move stuff. As you see already, there's a lot of shortcuts to do everything easier. So it can be a bit or difficult to remember them all at the start, but over time, you'll just get them stuck in your head and it'll make your workflow much easier. Similarly to Procreate, we have our layers here. So we can draw under and over the black lines. And we can also make new frames, which allows to do animation. So on this one, we could have it like this. On this one, we can have it like this and play the animation, for example. 
So it's already in, the animation's already integrated to start with from here. Similarly to Procreate, I have my hue slider with brightness and saturation. And another cool thing which is good about this, uh, let's get rid of this frame for now so I can see frame one more clearly. Uh, get the brush. We can fill in with the G, this part here. And as we said on Procreate, we had some issues when snipping things out. On this side, no such problems. Likewise for when we enlarge. All stays pixel perfect, which is extremely nice. As I said, this site, this was entirely made for pixel artists. So everything you'd ever need to do on pixel art is on here for all these extra options to do basically anything. Another cool feature it has, which uh, you can kind of procreate, but a lot more manual effort is importing and exporting sprite sheets which can be extremely helpful and save you a lot of time. Uh, like of anything as well, um, export is the option for when you want to save an actual image, save, save the file. So otherwise, very similar to Photoshop, just lots of cool features. Ooh, another one you have on here, which Procreate doesn't have yet. I'm hoping it will soon, or the way they have it doesn't always work perfectly, but replace color. So I can say, for example, I want to replace all of uh, all black, so just pure black, to all pinks. And I'll do the way around. Can you reverse it? So let's just make all blacks into reds. And I don't know if I had any blacks to start with. Should probably draw some black in. Draw in some black. Replace color. Um, so index black. Okay. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I said I'm not as used to using this one as it, Photoshop is my primary one. There we go. That's got it. So now it's changing all the black to whatever color I'm choosing now, which can be very helpful when you're deciding after you've perhaps finished a project, maybe a client says, can we have this blue to be this color instead? Very easy to just change all of it at once rather than manually going through and changing it pixel by pixel. So hopefully this is a pro feature that will come to, to procreate uh, soon or in a better way. But other than that, both very good pieces of software, obviously a little bit more money for this one, but anything you want to do with pixel art, you can do on this. And the really cool thing is, built into it, it has all the tutorials available from the app itself. So you can go through tutorials or full on just um, all the text options. So extremely helpful, helps you learn the key binds, how things work, very nice software. Okay, the next software we'll be looking at will be also on the computer, but a free version of it. So um, not as high tech as this, but a good introductory tool for if you don't know how much you like pixel art, you can go straight into that. Okay. okay the next software we'll be looking at is called Piskel. It's a free online editor, which is all browser based, so you don't need to download it or anything, or just runs on your browser. Unfortunately, its features are much more limited compared to the others. Obviously, it's free, so you can download, you don't even download it. Just open it up, try it out, and see how you feel with it before maybe investing in one of the other products. So, all you need to do, click on Create Sprite, and here you have it. Here is your canvas. So, normal thing, zoom in, zoom out, and you can draw on it. Uh, you may see that when you first open it, it draws like this with a grid in it. That changes just when you go onto the setting, disable grid. Likewise, let's make the canvas a little bit bigger for 100 by 100. Oops, did I not click? 100. Oh, resize, there we go. Otherwise, same controls. 
Control Z to undo, Control Shift Z to redo, zoom in, zoom out. Um, you can't change the brush size there. Instead, you've got to click on the top for these four options. Biggest brush, smallest brush. And that feature is somewhat limited. You can add in new frames here. So for example, we could have a ball falling down. And on the side here, you can see it playing the animation and change the speed, for example. We also have some cool features. So vertical mirror pen. So we can draw something that's reflected on both sides. We can draw a shape. We can fill it in. The key bind is B for bucket. And oh, let's change that so it doesn't go all crazy. Um, and then we can go on the select tool like so, and then shift grab allows to move it. So similar to a sprite, it is a pixel art thing, actual pixel art specifically page. So we have perfect lines unlike with Procreate, but as you see, the other features are more limited. A cool thing it does have as well is the fact you can have a differing brush, meaning you can add some like rudimentary shading quite easily. So quite simple, but free and runs in your browser. So no real investment required. Good. Have a bit of fun. Say so change all the colors at normal. Play around with it a little bit. And then obviously if you decide to like pixel art, you can always go back in and purchase one of the more substantial products. Awesome. So now we can, now that you might have decided which products you want to use, we can start on going on and making pixel art ourselves. So let's go right into that now. So far, we've been looking at how we can start creating shapes with lines and the shapes of gray so far, just tones of gray. But as you know, uh, one big part of pixel art is the use of color. And so knowing the ways that colors can interact with each other can be very helpful in creating uh, good artwork. So obviously I can't go too far to color theory because it's such a broad topic. You could easily have a 20 hour lesson on just all the color theory. So I'll just go over the very basics. So we have here a color wheel. I prefer to use this version, but we'll talk about that in a second. So we have all the colors around the edge, which and we call that hue. Then we have saturation, which is how much gray there is in it, and darkness, which is how much black or white there is in it. So that's why I like using this version. The top slider is hue, the second slider is saturation, and the third slider is brightness. So I can change it through all these colors on all these hues. And that's why it's called HSB, hue, saturation, brightness. If we go back to here, we'll have uh, what we call harmonious colors. Harmonious colors are colors that are quite close to each other on the color wheel and they'll look good next to each other. So for example, if we are doing something in a green, let's make it a nice bright one. Turn that too bright, put that there. Makes it in a green. It also works if we do some, add some more yellow to it or add some more blue to it. The colors work together, but not so much if we add and a color that's further away from it. So that's got a harmonious color. So things that are next to each other in the color wheel. Then we have complementary colors, which I personally hate the name of, because you think by the name, it's things that would work well together because they're similar. Instead, it's the opposite colors. So the things that are opposite on the color wheel. So for blue, the opposite would be orange. For green, the opposite would be pink. The reason why these look good next to each other isn't because they're harmonious like the others, it's because they contrast so much. So for example, this and this contrast so much, it can be quite a striking image. Some people like using them, some people don't like using them as much. Thankfully, Procreate has a nice nifty feature here called Harmony, where we can see the harmonious colors, or analogous as it calls it on here, 
This will show you colors that will go together well. Or the complementary colors. Let's brighten up a bit. Complementary colors. So the ones that are on the opposite sides. As well as some slightly more options. So the two colors that are opposite. If I'm going to do like a um, three color spread. Or triadic. Ones which are on the, the three opposite sides of the color spectrum. So green, blue, red, for example. You'll often see this in a lot of like um, marketing campaigns or branding. We'll have a triadic color scheme. And lastly, there is tetradic. So the four opposite corners, making a square. So the, this is one way you can help choose your colors if you're not too sure about what to use. Personally, I like to go just like a, with my gut, just play it by eye, to see what colors I think work well together. Some people prefer to go for a more scientific approach by using stuff like this. All depends on personal preference and how much experience you've got in using color to start with. Another part of color theory, which you've probably seen somewhere before, is about hot and cold colors. So if we go back to our regular color wheel, colors in this section of the wheel, so the reds and yellows, are more hot colors. Well, evoke more strong emotions, um, like anger for red, stuff like that. Um, if you see red colors and yellow colors, it'll just be like a warm day. So it gives like happy emotions. On the other side, the greens, blues, purples, they are the cold colors. So it might be more like sadness or a cold day, stuff like that. So you can use certain colors in your art to represent certain emotions by using the different colors. For example, if we drew someone um, with more blue skin or in like a blue room, it might imply that like they are more sad, for example, or cold. Whereas if we did the opposite. So those are the basics of color theory. Next thing we'll talk about is called tone. So tone is basically how black or white an object is, how light or dark it is. So what I've been doing already before is tone. This was um, this grayscale. That is one way to use tone. Or we also call it value. How black? How much black or white is in something? So what we've done already is just a grayscale tone. What we can do though, which is a nice feature on digital art, is because we've already got all of this on one layer, I can select this layer, go into the layer above and drop in all of a color. Let's just do like a blue. Something like that. And fill this in. So all of this has become this blue color. And we have this gray color underneath. We can set, then set this layer effect, as all the layers have different effects that you can use. You tend not to use too many in pixel art, more in actual traditional art. Same for this technique, you'd use this more in like traditional uh, digital painting, but it is something that you can do if um, you choose to, but it's good for an example of how to use tone. I can go to the layer effect called multiply. And basically, it makes all the colors have this color in as the, as the whitest part of it, and then darkens it for each of the gray values, basically. So, all these um, images have the same tone, the same values, the same blacks and whites, but a different hue, where hue is the color. We just change the hue. The values for black and white stay the same, but the color changes. This can be really useful to do, for example, if you want all the shading to be consistent in terms of values, but different colors. So if I select this layer, now give them this like red shirt, then go to like a skin tone. Like that. So now he's got the, 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 the tones on his shirt and the tones on his head are the same. Uh, I don't like to work like this way. I prefer to just go through and choose my colors manually, as I said. I feel like it makes it more vibrant and it looks a little bit flat to me. But again, that's all personal preference. This is just one way that you can do it. But this is just an example of how uh, the tone 
will change um, how something looks in terms of how dark and bright it is. And if you use darker colors, you can create more contrast, which can make a more vibrant image. For example, I think this one here looks pretty flat. So I could go to the layer above and oops, need to make that a bit smaller now. Add in a bit of a highlight on this side, maybe a bit brighter. Maybe add in those. Add in a highlight here. Let's go towards an orange. I find like um, orangey colors are good highlights for reds if you don't want to go too vibrant, too bright red. Kind of the outline where the chest and the arms will fall. And you can always darken the back side of it as well. I think already it's popped out a little bit more. I'd probably go for slightly more vibrant red, I think. So what I can do is I've just made another gray layer underneath, the one we had before. And the same thing again, going to go onto my adjustments. This is where I can change how uh, bright or saturated or the color of an object. was all back to normal. So now what I'm changing is the tones, the gray layer underneath uh, this um, color layer that I made, about set to multiply, just so we can see how it affects it. So we darken the tones, all the colors will get darker until black. It's not affecting that layer upon top because that's um, on a layer above the multiply layer. Obviously, if you go brighter, it'll go all the way up to white where all the tones disappear. So you kind of adjust it to levels which you think work well. And if we take off the multiplies, you can see exactly what I'm doing underneath. Just changing the darkness of the gray layer underneath, which changes the when I've got a multiplier on, so multiplier like multiply layer on changes how it change, it affects the colors on top of it. Uh, but as I said, I like to go through manually to <clears throat> I've had to go through manually when I'm choosing my colors. I feel like it um, gives me more more options on how I make certain things pop out, and I also find the experience of it more fun. And when I'm doing like big landscapes, I tend to work in grayscale and then add color afterwards. All depends on what sort of um, method I'm going for. Awesome. So, as I said, let's um, get rid of this layer before. And let's start trying to color in. So, what we can do, and you can follow on with me if you like is coloring in the apple and the pillar that we had just done. So I'm going, you can either go on the layer above like I did and just drop in a color, but it'd be more fun to start anew. So what I've done is I've just selected the layer. I'm gonna to go to the layer above. So that all, the only thing I can do now is draw inside where I drew before. So I can't change the outline, I can only change the inside of this shape. I'm going to do a red apple, I think, rather than a green one, for example. Let's start off with a nice mid-tone colour. I prefer to start with the mid-tone and then do the highlights and shadows after the fact. So, first of all, I'm just going to fill this in like so. And then let's do, let's do four colours. That's usually three or four colours, what I tend to like to do with colouring in my pixel art. It almost depends on if I've got a outline or not. So let's just start dropping in quickly. A little bit more grey than that, I think. Like a shadow. I said I like to drop things in quite quick and then adjust it afterwards but everyone will have a slightly different way of working. And you know, zooming in and out is really helpful as well, because when you zoom out, you can see the whole image, which can help you get a bit of 
perspective on how it looks. As I said before, spheres can be one of the more difficult things to shade, which is why they're good practice, but they are also quite tricky. So if you are struggling, don't read too much. It is definitely a trickier shape. The column should be a little bit easier when we get to that one. Also, if you bring up a picture of a, an apple yourself, or maybe get one if you have one, it can be good to look at a real one for examples of how the light's shining on it. I'm mostly just going from memory here. As you can see, I got rid of a little bit of shading and got to start with because I didn't really like how it was going. So I'm going to draw, go, draw it all in normally. I'm going to add for shit another layer of shading over top. Just bring out some of that roundness. Again, I'm assuming that the light is coming from the same as before, the top right corner. So it's good to have a consistent light source that you tend to work from. Although if there's a specific light source in a scene that you're drawing, you've got to take that into account as well. For example, if a character's sitting next to a lamp, we'll have the light from that lamp you've got to draw in. Okay, I quite like how that's going so far. So let's now add in some highlight. I'm gonna to go to more of a yellowy thing, I think. Yeah, I quite like how that works. We have like the bright highlight, where the, I'll be the brightest on the surface, where the sun is bouncing off the apple, make it look nice and juicy. But I might even choose to go a little bit brighter than that. I think that works. Let's add a little bit more shadow on this side. It's not quite there, maybe another line back. When you're working with so few pixels in pixel art, sometimes it's just lots of trial and error trying to find out what works. And don't be afraid to try out something new as well. I think I quite like that. So now, obviously, one thing we are missing is the actual stalk part. And we'll do that in just some brown. So let's go to... Brown's one of the awkward colours. So obviously, it's somewhere in the reddy yellow area. And you can get very different types of brown depending on where you go. I probably want to be one in the reddish section around an or dark orange kind of like there again if you're not too sure about what color to use one good thing for the blonde software i'm using go onto the layer above draw it in and then we can go just on just on that layer change the hue saturation and brightness just for that one piece so whoops go back onto it I think the hue is right. And something like, do I want it to be bright? Like somewhere like that. So it doesn't draw too much attention. I think I'd darken that as well. Definitely want to do a highlight on it. 
Just a little, little bit of shadow maybe like there. So then one on the base. Something like that, I think. And do I want to darken the middle here? Uh, yeah, I think I'm happy with that. What if I actually do a bit of a rim light on the outside? Yeah, I think I like that as well. Obviously, it's doing quite nice and quick. But obviously, take your own time with it. Um, experiment. I'm going to try different colors. Um, we'll talk about using texture later. So I'm not going to put any texture on this one. But I think that reads well as an apple. So we can leave that there. Now, let's go on to the column. Play a bit of a simpler one. We'll do the exact same thing again. So let's start with... What type of column do I want to do? Let's do like a nice... Like, just off-white marble. Uh, let's merge these, go to a separate layer. Select this, oops, no. Select this again, and big brush. There we go. Um, maybe a bit more gray. Yeah, quite like that as a mid-tone. I said, I like to start with the middle value and then go brighter and darker afterwards. So, um, we want our lines in. So that's the one I'm going to do in like the darker color. So let's go to a bit more of a gray, darker gray red, like that. Go back to our single brush. And basically just redraw in our lines as they were before. So let's double check where they are using this one. Something like. Well, it doesn't have to be perfect as how it was before. It's your own pillar. Trying to space them out a bit so it looks a little bit more curved. I think I want to start with this one being two, two. In terms of how thick, how far apart I'm doing the lines, two, one. There we go. That looks nice and round. And then we can start adding on where the light will be hitting it most. So let's go to an almost an almost white. Sometimes when you're on a, a light on a light background like I am, it's going to change the color behind it. Just so you can it'll see you can see it a bit better. Let's go on to a layer below, make a new one, and just get like a dark gray, which you can set as a background. Whoops, a rectangle. And There we go. Now we've just got a bit more of a background colour so we can see it a bit easier. Again, as I said with Procreate, it's added this little like um bit on the outside, which I didn't necessarily want. But in this case, I think it kind of gives it a nice little like a uh, picturesque effect. I'm not gonna complain too much. Sometimes as as they say, happy little accidents. So let's just add on where the highlights will go now. Again, imagining the light hitting from the top right and side. So the light won't hit just underneath the rim. So I get a little bit further across with that. Like so. Obviously that's showing where the light's hitting from. Um, I think because the light's hitting main on this side, I'm going to lighten the bits in between here. Play just the bits in between the whites. Like that. Maybe even take it to the bottom. Like so. Okay. 
And then shall I darken? I think I'll do a darker color as well. So I'll darken this a little bit. Just have like for bits where it's most dark, kind of on like this side. Something like that. Probably make it pop out a little bit more. Now I think I'll actually change the color I started with here to be a little bit darker. And I'll do it on the layer above so I can easily change it if I don't like anything. Or I can change the values again like I did before. That's why using your layers can be very helpful in one, getting easily solving mistakes, and two, just allowing changes. But layers can be tricky to keep track of. It's all personal preference in how you end up using them. I think a bit lighter than that again. Be a little mid toed right in between. I think I'll let them like it. There you go. I think I like that. I'll leave that there. So again, it's still quite close to being in black and white. Just a teeny splash of some tones. Just to make it look like a bit older, maybe. And of course, you could always do something behind it as well, some background. Um, you could have like a, I was just doing something quick, use this as the select layer, let's have like a, some sky, and then follow this on, I should do a little bit darker I think, if I'm going to do background, yeah, something simple like that perhaps, and have a bit in the foreground be the same colour. Maybe just something like that. I should kind of I think I'd want to take this above put a simple layer above this one and add this in. Also can make it more of like a complete image like that. I did a little bit of colour to make it pop a little bit more. I don't even go for a lighter blue if I was doing that. There we go. I like that. So just, I think small things like that can make a big difference in the actual image you're making. So we've got the apple and the color that we made before now in color. Um, as I said, try this on your own. Try one or both of them maybe and just see how you get on with it and see what you can learn during the process. Another part of using color, as I mentioned contrast before, how dark or light something can be. Here I did obviously this darker tone there and this darker tone here. But some people like to use uh, solid black outlines. In some art, I do like it. In some art, I don't like it. Because a very different effect and will change how you would colour your sprite work depending on whether you use a light outline or not. Sometimes, what I like to do more than using a full outline is sometimes just like a partial outline. So like the very blackest corner. So for example, on the apple, if I did it on like the side opposite the sun, just do a little black outline there. Some people like to do the full black outline. But as you can see, it gets tricky when we are using a thin sprite like this. Hard to go all the way around it still. So you'd probably just have to have that in black if you're doing that. Again, obviously it changes as well for how big the sprite you're using. The bigger the sprite, the easier it is to have a big bl a black outline without it affecting your colouring. As you can see, now it looks, it pops out more, that's for sure. Um, so for small sprites, it can, especially ones you're seeing from a distance, it can make it really pop out. But in terms of what style you're going for, whether you're going for more realistic or more cartoony, I feel like the black outline lends to a more cartoony style. And as I said, sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't, depending on what the work is. Likewise for the pillar, I'm going to go around the whole thing rather than following the inside lines. Like so. So 
So some people might do the outline like just around the outside or more on the inside like that or even each of the grooves in the pillar individually. Like so. So, as I said, lots of different ways to approach um, pixel art in terms of both lines and in terms of colour, um, which can very much affect how the image will look and come about. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about is called dithering. That's D-I-T-H-E-R-I-N-G, dithering, which is a complex word for basically how we can add shading to pixel art using not just color or using um, fewer colors, I should say. So basically, um, in a nutshell, dithering is doing a pattern like So we can find like that. Some uh, pixel art software has dithering brushes built into it. But as you can see, it just makes this little cross pattern. Let's put it on its own layer. Which, when you put it over something, will make that section appear darker than the bits which aren't in dithering. There are also different levels of dithering. For example, we could have, that's like the, like the basic one, when you could do, for example, two by two. Or two by one. Or you can start spreading it out. Instead of being touching, you could have differing like, like this. There we are. I'll, go and I'll just show you my examples of how it affects color soon. Or I could have it alternating, something like that. Or this would be one more further apart. Oh, like that. So all different amounts of shading, basically how much color you're letting through and how much black you're covering it up with. So if we drop in a bit of a color behind here, you may not be able to see immediately, but you can, but um, this is one way you can make things look darker or even blend between colors. Uh, the best way to show this is if we have two colors. Let's just use this blue here. And a darker blue. I mean, that's quite far apart from it. Something like this. Let's make it a bit bigger too. Something like that. Now, we can use dithering to basically smooth out the gap between these two colors. So let's go back to my normal brush. I'll start by doing the two by two. I won't do two far across just to save some time. And then let's start spreading it out. And then we can always go a little bit further out. So there, there's one square here, there's two squares apart. And the next one would be there. So as you can see, it kind of blends the blue the light blue into the dark blue section. So it's basically just it gently transitions into it. We then do the opposite for the blue side. And just replicate the same pattern. And then twos. 
twos. Um, a little bit further apart. So like that. So if we get rid of the bit we didn't look at, like this part, cut that out. See, now it's more of a gentle transition than if we just had the blue and the dark blue. So this is, you can use this for shading, to basically bridge between a gap. Some people really like dithering and they'll use dithering for like all their shading. Some people use it sparingly. I use it somewhat, not but not entirely. And some people just like using regular, just um, similar tones. Because for example, if we took this apple again, and let's just uh, copy that layer. Um, let's, no, let's keep the outline for this one. Lay above and fill this back in. So now let's try do this with like two colors and maybe a white highlight. Let's go nice and dark. Well, not that dark, play a bit more here, like that. And then let's see if we can smooth this out with some dithering. Oh, let's start adding in some dots. And this one is going to do one by one dots. So I just kind of follow the shading and make go in this repeating pattern. Let's do one more maybe. And then let's try doing line of dots a bit further out. So I'm basically ignoring every second one. It can get a little bit tricky in imagining where they'd go. You know, something like that, so it's kind of, it's, this is only two tones, two colours, and the um, black outline. But I think already you can kind of see some depth coming into that. We could do the same thing on the other side with, for example, a white. So let's just add in a bit of a highlight to start with. I like to leave a bit of a line between the edge and the highlight, just because if you look at an actual sphere, that's where the highlight would Go. Maybe even not even this close. So that's just doing it cool. This Halloween may look better without the differing. We'll have to see. I said sometimes it's better with, sometimes better without. It's all just a personal preference and just how it ends up turning out. See that might even be too bright. But that, the, the example is of a principle. So we have used Divering to just use less colors, add in a more gentle shading effect. So try these out, try um, challenge yourself, try do the apple, the or the pillar or both, and try maybe one or both of the shading effects. Try use Divering, try not use Divering, see how that goes, see how you feel about it. As you saw, Divering can be a little bit more time extensive and a bit more menial, a bit more just boring putting in dots than splashing in some color but you can get a nice effect from it it's all personal preference how much you like how, how much you like how it turns out so we've learned how to do some color so next we'll start looking at some texture and from there we can actually start drawing some fun pictures awesome see you soon hi there congratulations on getting this far i hope you're enjoying the course and already starting to see some results if you like the tutorial so far and want to check out the extended version of the course, head to skillademia.com where you will find our full pixel art beginner to advanced course with more than 60 lectures and many more projects to complete. Now let's continue. Next up we've got to look at creating texture. So texture is basically just imperfections in the material that will let you know how the material feels basically. So for example, you could have a texture that looks like wood. 
So you could loosely see it, look at that and say, oh, that's wood, that's a tree, etc. Same for metal and stone or anything like that. The little bits of detail that make you say, oh, that is that material. We kind of did a little bit of this before when we looked at the column. All the little bumps in the column are basically just large things of texture to show you the shape of it. Um, but obviously we could go more into this and add in some like wearing perhaps and little bits of imperfections in the stone. Maybe to show that it's very old or that it's starting to fall apart. Little bits like that. Just give it like a little bit of a more of a rundown look. That could be an example of texture. Let's go through a few examples. So let's go make a new layer. We'll get rid of that one, go on to this one. So first of all, wood. So let's do just like a square for each of them. Let's just do a square of, let's say this size. I'll pop this on. Come on, move up. And let's fill this with just a solid color for now. So, and then we'll look at a few different textures. I'll just copy it a few times for now. Okay, now I've just got a little, little canvas to work on basically. So first of all, let's look at making a wood texture. So again, let's go to more woody color. Somewhere between red and orange, I like to go to maybe about there. Obviously, if you want to have like more of an old wood, it would be more on the gray side. Actually, let's go a little bit like that. Let's go about there. I quite like that. Or maybe a little bit lighter. I said colour's tricky. Okay, let's, let's go with that one. I said I like to go with the mid-tone first and then do the um, shadows and highlights afterwards. So we'll make this as a basically a floor tile, basically. So first of all, let's separate it up a little bit. Let's do it as two tiles, basically. Two floor tiles. Like that. Now, how can we make it look like wood? What do we know about wood? We know it has these those little lines in it to show where the wood was. The the um so markings on the tree. Obviously they stick out in the wood a little bit. And that's the main thing you want to imply. Also those little wooden rings as well. Little deformations. Make them kind of semi-random because organic shapes tend to look a bit more random. And then obviously we can go in with some another colour and do the same thing. Probably a bit lighter, I think. Play more there. A bit more yellow, I think. And maybe a little bit darker. Something like that. And add in similar effects on both sides. And all being well, this will give the impression of it being wooden. Or, for example, you could turn this into a tree. If, for example, you continued this onward, it's kind of got the look of a, like a birch tree to it. Let's follow it on, like so. Okay, next one, well, we could look at metal. This is another common one you'll get to. And so in this case, I will get a bit of a bluish gray I like for my metals. Oops, on the wrong layer. Let me these back. A bit lighter, I think. And... Let's see around here. Okay. So, with metals, it's not so much indents in the metal like with the wood. Is more just how the metal reacts with light and some imperfections as well. So metal will have a strong shine to it. 
Actually, I think I will have to go a little bit lighter on the base tone. Maybe like a bit more grey. Okay. That can be a bit of perfectionist sometimes. Yep, so we'll have the bright highlight on it. Little bits of highlight. This is where the light will shine off it. Let's do a bit of pure white as well. And then obviously the darker bits too. Then on top of this, you'll I'm um, a bit too harsh actually. Maybe a bit lighter for the background. Obviously, it depends on what sort of effect you're going for as well. Uh, and also with metals, you'll have little indents in it of where, like, maybe it got banged if it's like a big sheet of metal. It might be easier if we thought of this instead of a square as something we'd actually see in our drawings. For example, maybe like a bad shield. So get this to be a little bit more circular. Obviously, I'm just doing quite rough. Doesn't have to be perfect if it's battered up. There we go. So, if we've got this battered metal shield, um, I should have it like a half. It's got a little bend in it. Play a bit more grey than that. I'm going to have a little bit of colour in it, but not too much. Well, it does look blue. I just want to give it like the impression of this little teeny little bit of colour. And when I have a bend in the shield like that, I like to just have a little gap there. Let's think about where the light would hit. Yeah, with metals, it's more about thinking about where light will land on it. Not just going to have a couple of dings where maybe you've blocked a couple of swords, strikes. And then where the highlights will go. The brightest parts. So the main thing about metal is just how it shines compared to other, other materials. Something like that maybe. Obviously, the more colours you use, the more shading you can put into it, so the more realistic it can be. When you're just using like three colours for this, sometimes you've got to simplify it a little bit and abstract it a little bit. I may even make that a little bit darker as well. And I do find that like a spot highlight does like pure, a bit, a little bit of pure white helps with some metals just to show how shiny it is. There we go, I prefer that now. Also, a, another thing that can be tricky to show with texture is something like water or fire. In this case, you kind of, instead of showing how, like the imperfections in it, it kind of implying the movement of it. So with water, let's get a nice healthy blue colour, nice that and here we're kind of just implying like the ripples and waves in the water trying to show a bit of flow in a not moving image obviously when you're animating it it can be a little bit easier because you can kind of um show waves coming and out a fish flow swimming through it but static image you kind of just want to sh give the impression So the highlight and then the little shadow underneath the ripples is how I tend to like to do it. I'll maybe go for a bit more of a vibrant blue. And then make the white a little bit brighter too. Something 
Something like that. This is like a, a tranquil pond, kind of. For stone, stone follows quite a similar rule to uh, how I do wood. Uh, completely leave that quite like it is. Play a little bit lighter for stone. I like to have a little bit of red in it as well. This has got a little earthy tone to it. Yeah, for stone and dirt, it's more just about like the random imperfections. So I tend not even to even think too much about it. Just put in little dots and lines and kind of just imply where some light sources might be, where it bumps into it. Obviously, if this was a natural rock, it'd probably be more curved, like that. Something on those lines. And then for earth, again, similar to wood and stone, little random little bits of detail to show where like the high and low points in the earth would be. Throw in some rocks, throw in some grass, and it all comes together. Likewise, in this little water one we did, there's something like a little stone in here, around where the waves would flow. Use the same colours. Actually, I'm going to use brighter colours for this one because it's quite a bright image. Play a nice white highlight, then a grey stone. And there'd be more water details around it as the water ripples around the stone. Something like that. That might even go a bit lower. Something like that. Okay, um, they're probably the main textures of logs I've come across. You just kind of think about how they look and would interact with the world when you see it. Um, the last one that you might have to think about, and this is similar in terms of water, I briefly mentioned it before, is fire. So again, with fire, it's not necessarily the shape of the fire, more the impression of the movement of it. So this will come more across if you're doing animation work, but if in a static image, you've got, got to capture that essence of movement. So with fire, I like to just uh, very quickly, just not thinking too much, get in a rough shape of like a flickering flame, a couple of bits coming out, as like little sparks or embers. Add a little bit of red for the kind of like darker parts of the flame, the visual interest. And then we'll go to like a bright yellow. Maybe that, maybe a little bit more actual yellow. So like that for fire. And obviously this would be like attached to something like a wall sconce. You know, something like that. Yeah, so textures you would add on to your shading and your line work just to give it, make it look more like that specific material. So water, wood, metal, whatever. Just so that you can look at it and say, ah, oh, that is that thing. All these parts will come together. So for example, if we go back to the apple we drew before, on this layer. We'll go to the first one I did without the dithering, like this. Got a little bit more visual interest by adding in like um, little parts of where maybe the apple got like banged or dropped or little parts where it just catch for light a little bit differently. Adds a little bit of visual interest. I can use techniques similar to Divering just to show with a little bit of texture. So instead of being like a nice pristine apple, maybe it got thrown around a little bit. Always like little like bits where the skin has started to peel off. Maybe it's gone a bit old, that sort of thing. Likewise, instead of a pillar, it can kind of show some damage. Or with, for example, the ground I drew for the pillar, add in. I can always do a little bit of Dithering. Because diving is good for texture too, as well as just shading. Add in, so we not just adds a little bit more visual interest. I 
I can always add it in like a cloud or two. I like to go kind of like a little, very light pink for my clouds. That would be too, just for the vaguest implication of a little bit of color in there. The clouds on this scale are a bit tricky to draw. I'm gonna make them nice and spread out. Okay, nice little random patches, not to think about them too much. Just laying the impression of a nice little wispy cloud. And then let's go to the brighter color, a bit like more white. Let's add a little bit more. So from just a couple of lines, we've added the texture, which kind of gives it the implication of clouds. Could even add in a little, little sun in the top. Something like that, maybe. Just to show where the sunlight is coming from. Obviously, if you have got a light there, you might need to add in a bit more of a change for the clouds. Something like that. Awesome. So that's basically everything you need to know about um, adding texture. So now from here, we can start by actually creating some art of our own. So to practice looking at the textures, um, try challenging yourself by drawing some of these textures like I did before. Obviously you can think of some other materials that we didn't cover and uh, challenge yourself a little bit. See if you can do the wood, stone, metal, water, anything like that, or just look around you. Maybe look at your wallpaper, try and replicate that, something like that. Awesome. And then after this, we can start creating some actual figures. Okay, so now that we've got all those basics covered, we could start by maybe drawing some figures of our own. So first of all, we'll go on to what you may have spotted before. This layer, which is full of squares. And what all these squares represent are the different sizes of pixel art that people tend to create. So the very smallest, this one here being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, because we don't count the top one. Eight pixels by eight pixels inside the square. I'm not counting the outside edge. That one here is eight by eight. A bit hard to write when it's this small. There we go. Eight by eight. This one is twice as big, 16 by 16. Then we've got 32 by 32. The big one is 64 by 64. And the, big, the largest one is 100 by 100. So they're the, the main sizes of pixel art people tend to use. I tend to like this size big at most, the 100 by 100, followed by this size. I don't tend to like drawing too small, like especially for figures. I prefer to have like some lots of detail in them for stuff like fighting games, things like that. But some people prefer working much smaller. But these are all the sizes that people tend to draw in. Imagine there are quite different techniques to drawing out these different sizes. So for example, if I was drawing um, 100 by 100, like we did before, I can sketch out a person's full height, quickly mark out some points, and then obviously just doing something very quickly, nice broad shoulders, legs, whatever. Always have them in like some fighting stance or whatever. Nice and easy. You can see already how much room we have to add additional details. Even in the face, we could start, it takes a lot clearing up. We can start adding in lots of detail in the face. You can add in hair. You've got plenty of room for facial features, expression, all that stuff. You can put in lots of detail in there. However, as we go smaller in size, so even, actually no, let's, let's kneel this one first. I shall take it onto its own layer. 
uh, cut and paste. I shall go to my three wide razor and kind of just get rid of some of the construction lines a little bit. So I've got five wide. And draw it in a little bit nicer. Obviously this is just something I'm doing very quickly as an example. If I was doing a full sprite like this, it'd probably take at least two or three hours to finish fully. If I was working for like a client perhaps. So just an example in something like a, a walking pose, like if it was like a beat em up game, you often have quite side on walking animations. I said with my style, I kind of like to draw things in, kind of chip into it until I've got it how I like it. Little noodle arm. Obviously not perfect, but it's uh, does the job of showing what I need right now, which is how you have to change details as you get much smaller. So if this was how it would be in the 100 by 100, obviously I'd change this more. I'm not too super happy with this, but for the example, we can then, oops, actually let's copy it first so we can see at the end. So each time I'm just going to make it smaller using the nearest neighbor so it keeps the pixels pixely and just see how it changes as we get smaller and smaller and the details we lose. Might have to fill it in a little bit as well. Because sometimes when the pixels get too small, it just gets rid of them. <laughs> That's it. We might not even have any pixels left by the time we get to eight by eight. There we go. As you can see, a very rapid degradation in quality. So if we filled in some of the details that got deleted, it's becoming a bit tricky to even see where I'd put some of the lines. Yeah, for, for these two smallest, I don't even know where I'd start with filling those back in. But even when you get to something like 32 by 32, we no longer have any details left for the face. We are now left with just a tiny, what, nine by 12, uh, sorry, three by four space to put pixels into. This is why you will either have things be extremely simplified as you get smaller, like with this, it, all the details will be compressed and just give like, for example, an eye line, or you'll actually change the shape of it. Yeah, I might get rid of that now because I'm not too happy with that design. But we can start to talk about how we'd draw smaller stuff. So because we can't always draw them to a human scale with keeping the details, instead you do something like make the head much bigger in comparison to the body. More like more proportions to as things you'd see in like um, Minecraft, perhaps. And then we still got all this space to add in face details, and we have space for to draw in like the limbs and stuff. Got something like that of that size. Of course, you might need to bring it a bit lower if you want to have hair and it still be in that 32 by 32. You might have to cut an inch off the legs, for example. Oops, oh, I'm on the same layer as that, that's a bit annoying. But yeah, so you, if you didn't want to keep it all, even the hair inside that 32 by 32 square, you might have to get rid of, for example, a bit of a torso or a bit of a legs. The same rules apply even more so when you're getting smaller and smaller. Because at this point, the head would be like that. 
if we're drawing like an actual to scale person. There's no detail at all left. So again, I'm gonna have like a head, even even bigger. When you're working at scales this small, every pixel is even more important because you, you are so limited. A lot of people really like that challenge. For people who tend to work in the scale, do like the challenge of trying to fit everything we need to do in this tiny space. Because I prefer the freedom to work in this style. So at this point, you you are you don't have much choice. You kind of do just have to very much imply features and very much stylize and abstract your designs to make them readable. I mean, at this size, you probably wouldn't even try to do characters at this size. You wouldn't even have a black outline for this. You'd have to have it, things are shown by the different colors. So for example, if we do it in a gray, And then we have like darker color with some of the details perhaps. And if we want to add some arms, it might go to a light color. But at this level, it's quite hard to get too much detail in because you've literally got so few pixels to work with. So you do have to go very abstract with your designs. Something like that. With like a little space you or something. So yeah, so basically the rules are the bigger a uh, canvas you use, the more detail you can get into it, which um and the less you have to go into abstraction. So you you'll have to you can do more realistic proportions the bigger the canvas you use. So most fighting games like um old Street Fighters stuff like that will be more in this size, hundred by hundred. And um Sometimes like uh, platformers will tend to be either the size of even smaller, depending on what you're going for. There's some truth in that the smaller pixels you work with, the faster you can produce stuff. There's also more complexity in doing so. And then doing it make it so it looks good as well. Because obviously if you're doing a portrait this sort of size, you've got more tools you can work with in terms of details you can put in, but a larger canvas means more work. With this one, you have a small canvas, you have less choices, but trying to get the effect they are trying to get in this small canvas is even harder. So it could be spend longer to try to perfect it on this size than, for example, a bigger size like one of these. Again, it's all personal preference. What style are you going for? Because this style will have a super different style effect to this one. For example, this could be more like Pokemon in the, um, the actual RPG world screen when you're walking around. It'll be a sort of that sort of style, I think, with buildings being similar size. I think they're doing something like that little door. I'm pretty sure they're something like that size. Maybe probably a little bit bigger than that. It might be more 16 by 16. But that's the sort of scale it's at. So that's just the ways you can look at different sizes. Obviously, uh, try it out yourself. Um, see what you prefer drawing in. And then from here, we'll start actually drawing in some proper shapes and um, items, people, and Try all the different styles, see which ones you prefer, and then we can move on from there into more complex designs. See you there. Okay, so let's start um, creating some characters of these different sizes that then we can use later down the line to turn to full characters. So we're kind of just doing like a simple character framework for each of these sizes. So if you think about how a human body is shaped, I tend to go for a more uh, realistic look, especially when I have the canvas size to do so. And if you look at some of the old masters and how they construct human figures, like Loomis, that's where I get a lot of my 
um, knowledge from constructing figures from. And that's why sometimes I'll draw this line and halfway up the line is where the waist is. So where the body becomes legs. Top of the line is head, bottom of the line is feet. Halfway between the waist and the feet are the knees. Halfway between the waist and the head is the middle of the chest, the middle of the torso. Then halfway between that is the head, basically. Something on those lines. And then we want our character. I want him to be looking to the right. Let's have um, drawn a quick torso for him, which turns into the waist. And let's have him with like a little bit of a fighting stance. Obviously, it could just be a little bit rough for now because we're just using this as a base for anything we create in the future. Take this a little bit more, like so. I don't even mind keeping in all the construction lines for now because we will be ignoring them anyway when we come to add on details. But I'm even taking it up a little bit more just to stylize it. So I like the longer legs to body ratio. Okay, and we've got one arm going down here, like so, and one arm can go in front, something like this. It's clearing up so I can see where the second hand will be, something like that. Obviously it's a little bit uh, static, but this works as a rough template that you can hopefully follow from and we can add it to a more designed character and then from there make it a little bit more dynamic after the fact. But for now, this is simple, something simple that can suffice for any of our designs we add on to it. Okay, now let's do the similar thing to the next one. I think 64 by 64 will be able to keep a fairly similar ratio. How does that look? That yeah, looks fine. I might even stretch out a little bit wider just to uh, get a little bit more detail in and redraw in some of the lines we lost. Now, now we're getting smaller, um, we will have to make a new one. So let's do the head and try to keep the same pose. So I'm sketching it in, trying to keep it roughly the same silhouette. Um, but now I probably can't have the arms quite the same. Uh, something like that should suffice, I think. As I said, it's just got to do something quick because we'll be adding more onto it in the next stages. And I think I can probably take this one and use that for the next size down or quite something similar to it. I probably want to stretch it horizontally again. A bit wider horizontally. I don't know why it's drawing the lines. See, this point is getting just very abstracted. And then for this one, very basic shape. It's hard to even get much detail onto that one, so don't worry too much about it. I realise I got rid of that other one before, didn't I? So let's just do the reverse. Actually, no. I'm going to copy this layer, undo until it comes back again, there it is, and then I'm going to paste it in. There we go, problem solved. 
after you've worked for a good while, you learn how to fix any small mistakes you make like that. Okay, now I've got like a very simple mannequin for each of these. We can move on to the next step. Now we're going to look at designing some simple objects, then design some clothes, and then we can apply them onto these characters and basically make uh, a character from those. Okay, let's move on to the next step. Hey, welcome back. Let's start now by looking at giving our guys some weapons and armor, clothing, so-and-so, just to give our um, figure some more visual details or things he'd use, for example, in an animation where I use. So let's start off by looking at something like um, a sword and shield you might give to a knight. So I'm gonna start off by just um, getting rid of these at the moment, just making a new layer. Just for, for, for an example, and then we can go and add them onto the actual character themselves and make them to the same scale. So we'll just do something like a regular long sword, short sword type of thing, which can be trickier than you expect, especially when you're doing animation. As we said before, in terms of lines you can use in pixel art, we have these straight across lines. We have two by two. So we're going two each time. Or we have going three each time. Or we have four each time. Four, 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 four. And as you can see, this limits how many different angles we can have a sword pointing in. Which means that when we're designing our character, we have to bear this in mind. But if you want to have any straight edges, we can only use angles such as these. Which when you come into animation makes it a little bit more tricky. But there's a lot of things you can do to get around this. So, obviously, we'll start out by just saying either a vertical or horizontal. And then obviously we can try one with a little bit of an angle as well. Separate these out a little bit. I shall just move this over here for now. And draw a new one on a new layer. So I like to start out my drawings with a black outline. And then I'll either keep the outline or get rid of it depending on what I'm doing. Because this is quite small, I'll probably get rid of it, but we'll see. So first of all, let's see how big do we want it to be. Let's do it about this size, maybe, for the biggest one. Obviously, I'll go through all the sizes and talk about how I do it for each. I'd like to have it with the same dimensions on each side. Follow each of the patterns going up so we get to a point and just neaten it up a little. Add in the, the guard. Something on the lines of that. It's one further out, doesn't it? Something like that. And then the where he'll grab onto it. And maybe a little something like that. And we'll like about the right size too. Maybe a little bit short handle. There we go. Obviously, how thick you do it, how wide or long, is entirely personal preference. Okay, so now I've got the actual um, rough design of it down. I will add in a colour on the inside of all of it. So that'll be the colour that I want like the main weapon colour to be. The like steel, stuff like that, metals, I tend to like a very um, just off blue. Oops, and he's going to layer below. Maybe a little bit brighter. 
I guess something like that works. And then for the handle, for not for the um the 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 guard, I'll do like a gold. I like to do gold the kind of a slightly less saturated yellow. And it'll bring out the actual gold appearance in the shine that it has. When for the actual handle part, I like a little browny red colour. Okay, not too vibrant because I don't take away from it. There we go. Now I could theoretically, depending on what star you're using for, just do a little highlight and call that done. But let's try to do it a little bit more detailed. So now let's replace the black outline colour with something else. Um, we'll start by doing a darker version of the colours surrounding it. Maybe a little bit darker than that. I'm going to give it a little bit of depth. Maybe a little bit more blue. And a lot of this intuition will just come from more practice in terms of colour. Or red, I think. And then the dark brown. A bit more saturated. Okay. So now we have no black outline. So we've got to decide where we want the light source coming from. Typically, I choose the top right hand side. But you can use top left, straight above, or if there's like an actual light source in the scene, use that one instead. So I'm going to assume the light's coming from the top left. Actually, I'll make the background just off-white so I can do some white highlights. Maybe a bit more grey though. So like that maybe. Okay, now let's add some white highlights onto this. So it'll be the top of the blade, just basically where you think the light will shine off the object most. So top of the blade. And I like to do it on the on the edge of the blade too, like the little um, where it bends in the middle. Then it'll be on this side of the handguard. Teeny bit on there. Then we'll place the bits which aren't in full light back into the original colour. Because I don't use, I'm not going to use too many colours for this one, probably only three or four. I think I'll do four actually. Because I want to have a slightly darker colour for this, maybe a little bit more blue. Because on the back of the blade, something like like that just to give it a little bit more round. How about if I do it on this side as well? What does that look like? Um, I'm going to prefer about. Something like that. I say pick slides experiment, see what works. It's very easy to undo it and try something different. There's no hard and fast rules involved so it's kind of just do the art that you want to make. Which is very nice. See, I'm just making that a little bit less dark there. Mid-tone too. To soften the light a little bit. And a little highlight here maybe. I'm just going to add in more details now, if you'd like, if you want to take it a bit further. I think I'm quite happy with how that looks as just a basic sword. So you could um, uh, give it more details, change the shape of the blade, make it bigger, smaller, add in more details in the guard. You could always add in like some like a um, magic gem or something, because it'd go a bit more like uh, 
out a bit further, something like that. Plenty of rooms, plenty of room to experiment and try your own thing. Likewise, this sword, unless it's small image onto one layer, will stay the same if we turn it vertically. But as you can see, now I've turned it this way, the light's now shining from the wrong direction. But we can just flip that horizontal and it's the right way again. But if we were to recreate this on a slightly different angle, like all these angles we have here, I can't turn it that amount because if I rotate it, it goes a little bit funny. Actually, that's kept it fairly well. It's only got a little bit weird on the edge. So that's how it would look in 45 degrees, more or less, would require a little bit of fiddling to get back to normal. You can see it's messed up all the... I love where I put, up, put some of the marks down. And that's because um, it's got to shift it from being in one alignment to another alignment. So it doesn't always match up straight away. It gets even more pronounced as a problem when you go a little bit further. So this would be this line, this line, and so on. So depending on what software you're using, I feel like nothing could do it perfectly, but play more pixel art related ones could probably do it a little bit better than this. What do I love there? So if I was to do one, for example, at a slightly more, let's try this angle here. So what's that three every time? So let's do the exact same design. Let's go one, two, three, 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 three. Uh, how long is it? One more. Something like that. Then let's curve it to a point. Something like that, maybe. Again, this can require a little bit of just trial and error to see what works. And then just take it back down again. And also now, the handle will also be turned. So the handle, or the guard I should say, um, would be more at that angle, I think. Something like, something like this. Yeah, sometimes you kind of got to like exaggerate it or imply it to not go like, exactly how it should go, does how it would look good going that way. This is more of an example of how it can get trickier doing different angles. And the design has to change little bits to account for that. That wants to be higher up, doesn't it? About there. Is that four wide? Three wide. Might have to made out a little bit thicker for this part, I think. I think it still wants to be higher as well. I said sometimes it's just a lot of trial and error seeing what works, especially at these funny angles. One more go. And then let's put the cap on it. Something like there. Let's make it thinner on this side. A bit thicker on the top, I think. Okay, let's add in some color. Maybe a bit more pointy. Take that a little bit further. Something like that, maybe. It's hard to get it quite perfect. 
I think we get in there. Maybe if I just go straight across there. I think that works. Take up my, that middle line I drew. I said it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to look good. And hopefully those two things come together. But sometimes it takes a few goes. And sometimes meticulous for planning it, it doesn't always work perfectly either. But everyone, as I said, everyone likes to work in different ways. Some people very much like to plan everything meticulously. Some people like to just go in, start putting down brush marks and see how it turns out. And change it where as is needed. So I'm just following the pattern I had before and just putting in the lines in the similar sort of places. Likewise for the handle and here. And using the eyedropper to choose the same colors. Which is perfect for pixel art when you want to keep things as similar as you can. Uh, something like that. And then add in the highlights. Might just require a little bit of tweaking. If you are doing animation work, minor differences, you probably won't tell too much in motion. Whereas if it's a static image, it's um, it could be more apparent. So it just depends on what type of work you're doing, how much has to match up with other stuff. So you can probably leave it something like there. But as you can see, it was much more tricky doing the second one than the first one. Even though the colors and design are the same. The limitations of pixel art, I mean, you can only go so many pixels up and across, made it a little bit trickier to all come together. So these rules would apply for all of these different angles you could do, um, with the easiest being, as I said, straight up and straight across. But now that I've got this one done, I could copy it for the other side, for example. When we're making them smaller for the smaller designs we did, the exact same process, but probably less detail. I said you could even do these ones we've done here more detailed. I decided not to go too far overboard, because obviously the bigger it is, the more options you have. I just want to keep it more just for basics at this point. So if we bring these guys back on. Let's copy this for an example. This sword would be a little bit too big for this guy now unless he is, for example, a, a Guts anime character. So instead, we'll use similar colors. Uh, actually, no, let's reduce the opacity here so we can see behind it a bit clearer. Now I go back onto the black. So if we're adding in a sort here, I'd kind of just sketch it in over this grayscale. I think realistically the sword would probably be about that size, but because it's art, you can probably exaggerate a little bit further still. So in this case, it'd just be a little bit smaller, I think, than we, the one we did before, but very much the same level of detail. Take this one out a little bit thicker at the top. We could do this one as an example of if you did leave in a black 
outline. So when you use a black outline, black effectively works as one of your other colors. So you can basically replace your darkest color with the black. So if I wanted it to go, um, black outline to go all the way around, have it like that. And then I do like to have the little darker color behind just to give this all a little, on me, give us all a little bit of depth. Flip it on like so. So you could leave the blade like that. Or I quite like having the black outline only on the darker side. So you could even do it like this, where the black's on the back side, but not on the side that would be lighter. Okay, I don't love this style as much. I think it does work better in larger stuff, but that's just personal preference for me. Likewise, add in the rest of the handguard. Sorry, sword lovers and uh, weapon lovers, if I do misterm anything. Which I've asked the pommel. That could be wrong. A little bit of a highlight on it. The black going up there. We could have something like this. Leave the black going down there. So that's how you could do it at that level. But then, as we get smaller and smaller, we have even less room to work with. For here, we'll end up being basically a bat unless you do stylize it further. So here, his hands play about there. So you could, for example, if you want to have it, let's say it's just horizontal for sake of easiness at this point. Could make the sword very big and stylized, something like that, so you can still see it. Or you could have it turned 45 degrees as well, I think. You could have it like that as well, I think. It'd still work. And just fill in the details. I might have a little longer and pointier. You can kind of, and the hill would definitely be way thinner. Place it like that, and obviously add in the guard. Let's swing simpler like that. More, way more stylized, because obviously the shape of this one is extremely different from the shape of this one now, especially in terms of just realism. I think we could probably even done this original sword would weigh larger because it does look a little bit small for him still. Yeah, it's probably about the size of like a short sword rather than a long sword. So we could definitely do that one longer if we do it again. Also this one is kind of like a big dagger more in terms of actual the size of it and shape of it. But we could also make it even wider when you're making games of this level, it's more like the fact that um, you'll be told it's a sword, so you'll, you'll know it's a sword. And how it works, the, the slashing noise that go with it, the animation, will help sell the fact that it is a sword. These facts are doubly so for when you get to these levels here, where in this one, it's even less detailed you have. With this, it's very much just a line with a bit of shine on it. At this point, you think you would very much need some sound effects or animation work to show it is a sword. Even more so for this one, where at this point you would just have a line, sword across, sword down, something like that. Shield. 
Yeah, there's a limit to about that point in there. But as you can see, very different techniques for the different sizes you're using. So this is how you could do a, a rough saw design at all of these different levels. I might have even try to see what that looks like with without a black outline. Personally, I prefer that, but it's very much personal preference on what sort of style you like. But we'll leave it like that for now. Next thing we'd want to give a knightly character would be a shield. So let's talk about that now. I find drawing shields pretty fun because we can use all that we've learned in terms of textures and colors to make it our own cool designs. So if we were looking at a shield head on, Go on the same layer so I can uh, get rid of them. Okay, so if you're looking at a shield just regularly, you could think of the, the shape of it. Something like that for a knight shield. I'm just going to copy it, dupe it, flip it so I know it'll be symmetrical. Saves me the work of trying to copy it on both sides. So you have a night shield like that, maybe even a little bit longer, whoops, to connect them, freeform, maybe a little bit longer, something like that, maybe a little bit bigger if it's going on this guy, there we go, oh that's really messed up the shape of it now, so let's Draw back over the outline with rubber and pencil. I get a smooth curve going up. Let's go up in twos here. Two, two, three, three, four. Get rid of this side. Let's do the same again where I copy and paste it. Save myself a job and get rid of the inside parts now. And get rid of the top. Dupe. Flip. And connect it back up. There we go. Got a shield. That's a nice size and a good shape. So in terms of a knightly shield, this is what you might imagine. But you could also have more of like a barbarian, like wooden buckler type of thing like that made of wood. The good thing about wood compared to metal is it's a little bit more uneven. There's a general rule in art which is things that are um, living things you draw without straight lines. Things that are created things like buildings you draw with straight lines. So because this one is metal I like to use straight lines. When it's wood I like to use not straight lines or not clean lines exactly. Depending on what how it's made, if it's like an elven shield, it'll probably be perfect. But if it's like some random cut out of a tree shield, it can be a little bit messy. And we'll just have a little metal part in the center, like a typical buckler shield. Something like that. So these are our two shield designs. With metal shields, I like to kind of imply a little bend in the center just as a cool visual detail but I also like to give it a bit of a trim. So I'm just basically just following the lines leaving a little gap but going in the same amount as this then across. Oops. Let's uh, split these apart so I can flip it again. Uh, cut and paste. Paste. Flip. Oops. Regular paste. And flip that. There we go. Saves me from doing it on both sides. Merge them. And get rid of this middle line. Like so. Uh, actually, do I just keep it on there? 
I'll play and play it with another color. But yeah, let's keep on with that. So it reminds us. So I like to have it so there's like a design or a color in the center part. And then the outside of it is a metal, either silver, gold, something like that. So let's start on a metal one. Let's, uh, should I do a gold trim? Let's do a gold trim. So we'll use the same colors as our swords. So let's grab my mid-tone, go to a three-point brush. Go onto the layer below so we can color it without affecting the line art. I'm going to fill in this gold trim. I just clean up any bits I go over. And then for the center, as we said, um, I like to do it kind of like painted, either painted or with some design. So let's just call, make it uh, red. So we can change it if we change our mind. It was underneath the gold layer, so now it can be very messy without messing it up. So like that. And then we'll do the shading and highlights in a similar way to how we've done it with the swords. So let's go around my darkest color for the gold. Select the outline. I'll just fill. And then we can go back over with the other ones. Um, what else do we have? Um, yeah, and then I'll do the regular gold on bits where it's not going to catch, not going to be in the, the darkest shadow. So on the right hand side. And on this side of here. It depends on if you want to get rid of that shadow or not, because it doesn't imply depth on that left hand side. So I think I would keep that there for now. I'll leave it like that. And then for the biggest highlight, or well, the secondary highlights, let's run it around again. Actually, I think I would get rid of it on the top bit there though. In fact, I may even have that as this highlight. and highlight on there like so and then the pure white just on the very hardest edge and then play the, cur the curved bit as well so like that i think i'd also put it in this uh, secondary highlight going on here just a little bit of like a rim light Okay, there's no right or wrong ways to highlight something, just however you think it works. Let's have a highlight on this side too. I'm going to do all of it like that. Does that work? Oh, I think that works. Yeah. How about just do it like this? And then I can have another white highlight on that bit there. And maybe even play take this actual full highlight down a bit more. Actually, I might even have the center bit here. So let's get little, little imperfections in metal can make the color pop out a little bit. Okay, that looks all right. And now the red inside. Um, I'm just going to leave it as a pure, as a solid red colour rather than trying to do like some emblem on it because that would take a good while because you could do, for example, a pattern of, say, a dragon or their insignia, for example. But since this is just a, an example, I'm just going to get a little darker tone of red for the far side. Basically where the light is least likely to hit. lighter tone for where the light is most likely to hit. Just something simple. 
just something like that. Just so it has a little, little bit of depth into it. And as I said, you could always go over and do some pattern on the shield, for example. And just take into account the highlights and shadows you've done on the layer below. In terms of a wooden shield, I'd do something like, um, we'll have the metal for that metal part in the center. Let's go below it. Go back to our three point brush. Fill in this center metal part. And then we'll want a wood color for the outer layer. Let's go something around. It can be a bit tricky finding the colour you want for wood, but you'll know it when you see it. I think that works all right. Again, with wood, the main way you give the impression of it is through a texture like we did before. So the lines and the wood that we want to be making. So let's leave it like that for now. And then we'll go on to this layer, select, Add on the highlights of the wood. I'll have to go more yellowy for one highlight. Swing around like that sort of tone. And then, you know, we could even have, just have to leave it black as that darkest, if I could be. So, highlight on the metal. Now let's just add in some more details. So back to my single brush, add in some of the wood pattern. Just quite sparingly for the highlights, most of it will come in for the darker tones. This I like to not think too much about it. Just put in marks and keep zooming out every now and then to change bits you don't like as much. And don't be afraid to mix up the highlights and the shadows for this one. In case of wood, it makes it look better, I find. Also makes it look, look, look a bit worn and damaged, which I like the idea of. And same for the midpoint of this one. Let's do something to make it look a bit metally, having a little rim shine on the outside. And a little bit of where it's got hit before, maybe. A little bit of a highlight on those areas. Something like that. It's got like kind of a knightly shield, and maybe like the barbarian shield. And we can basically follow these designs onto all these other characters too. If this was the direction the shield was facing. And for us, we've done the sword in the character's right hand, which means the shield would be in the left hand, which means we see the back of the shield. So an easy way to do this is we will join up the layers and we can copy these like so. Uh, let's get rid of our swords again. Uh, let's do that one, that one. Let's merge these. And all we need to do now is show the opposite side of the shield. So for this one, actually let's not join those back in. Do a bit more. Yep, so with this one, we can keep the wooden pattern we've got so far because what would change on this shield is it would just be a handle on the inside. So 
that we can keep most of the wooden pattern that's replaced by the metal was with some handles. That's where you put stick your arm in basically. It's very nice and simple. I said because this is kind of more of like a uh, barbarian damage shield, you don't have to worry too much about neatness. Let's play a bit too. I want to do kind of like a leather strap. But I want it to be a different tone than the wood. It's probably a little bit brighter than that. A little bit more saturated. Again, with this whole thing, it's all just about playing around with the colours and seeing when you get something that works. Even more red, maybe. Swing around here. There we go, that's the colour. And then give it a little, I mean, it's quite close to the one still, but a little highlight will hopefully bring it out a little. Get a little bit of shadow underneath. Maybe not perfect, but when you have someone's arms in there, you play won't know much of a difference. So for example, when you've got the guy's arm sticking through it, it'll be more obvious how it's all coming together. For the big knight shield, on this layer, yep, I am simply going to, because the inside of the shield would probably be wood. So let's take the color we had before, fill in this layer, and we have basically the inverse of it. And now we can follow the same pattern on the inside. You can also follow how the metal trim still stay on the outside if you want, entirely optional. It's kind of up to you how it looks on the reverse. But for simplicity's sake, let's just say it's all wooden, but following the same pattern. select this too so I can't draw outside of it. Makes it easier doing the edges that way. And then the highlight would be on this side. Obviously this is more important if you want to do the metal trim on the inside as well. You probably would see a little bit. For the sake of simplicity, we'll just uh, do the wood. Drawing the pattern. Obviously, you can knit it up as much as you want, depending on how much you're going to see. Because if a lot of it's being hidden behind the body, you can sometimes skimp out on some of the details. If it's going to be more apparent, then it's good to be careful with your marks. I think since it's going to be mainly hidden behind the guy, we don't need to worry too much about neatness and then likewise we'd have the um, the straps on it uh, this time we can always do it like in more of like a a gray or black or like a metal color perhaps entirely personal preference on how you want your designs to look but just to pop it out a bit more than the other one I could do kind of like a, a grey. Something like that. And then obviously do a bit of shadow behind where those uh, would be. Something like that perhaps for the front and reverse of the shield. Again, it could look good if you have a bit of that trim on the outside too. I 
and just apply the same shading to it. In fact, we could probably cheat a little bit. We could copy this. We could scoop out the insides. What is that? Not a magnetism. And get rid of the middle part of it, just leaving. Get rid of the red bit and leave. I should probably be more careful and just do it. Um, yeah. Just get rid of the red bit for now and see how that looks. So I'm just rubbing out all the inside of it. Let's see how this looks. So rub out all that and then plop this over the top of here. Bring it to the layer above and does this look good? I think we need to change, do some changes. I think it'd need to be thinner. So if we just take it to two squares of the edge. Yeah, so once you can do little tricks to save time and effort. Take a little bit more off. Still like that maybe. Take off a little bit of a shine from the middle bit. I think that looks I think that works fairly well. Make a safety layer just in case. So those are two different versions. Actually, I want to add a bit more shadow now that we've got that gold trim on here. Just so it gives it a little bit more depth again. Something like that. And those could be that could be the front and back of our shield, depending on which arm he's holding it in, as I said. So now we've got a sword and a shield for our character. So in the future, when we start making some armor, we have some weapons for it. And again, you could try making these at all the different sizes. The same principles will stay, but still, still stay the same. However, just like when we did the swords, they'd get um, smaller and less detailed the further down we go, all the way until the bottom when it would just be one line basically. Otherwise, the techniques won't, will stay fairly similar. And as I said before, the black outline is entirely optional for your art style. Okay, so now that we've drawn some shields, let's try something else. Let's try drawing a magic staff. Uh, so for, for example, for like a wizard character. So for the next part, we can look at drawing a staff. So like for a wizard, for example, some sort of magic staff, depends on how you imagine it. There's lots of different designs you could go for. But I quite like the idea of kind of like a Lord of the Rings, like Gandalf style thing. It's like a wooden staff with perhaps like a gem at the end of it. So let's go onto a new layer above our thing. And just like with the swords and the shields, we're going to do them over our mannequin and um, so we can get the size right. I'll focus mainly on the big one and then I'll have a quick look at the small ones as well. So let's say I want it to be in the, let's go in the backhand. Actually no, let's do a front hand. We've got a bit more space to work with there. First, first of all, let's lay out a, a very rough thing of the actual shape of it. I like to give it a little bit of a bend in it because it's going to be a wooden staff and I think it looks pretty cool when wood things have a teeny little imperfections. So it's not 100% straight, it dips in and out a little bit. And then for the tip of it, I like to do it with a kind of 
just something, something like that, with like a gem on the inside. Maybe some like string around there. Okay, let's start filling that in. Let's go to a nice, let's go for like a nice healthy brown color. That might be a bit vibrant, a little bit lower. Uh, I think something like there. As I said, because it's going to be a little bit like gnarled and uh, weathered, I'm not too bothered about it being as precise as it was for, for example, the metal sword and shield. With wood, you can. It, I think wood looks a bit better if it's not always as perfect. So there's the rough shape of it. In fact, I think that wants to be a bit thinner. It looks a bit wide at the moment. Let's take a couple of pixels off. Maybe another pixel in some areas. I think that's looking a good size. Something like that. And then let's give it a nice cool like blue gem or something. Put a bit more, a bit more of like this tone, I think. Don't want that to fill up this section. I quite like the look of that. So the wood can kind of just be holding it in there. Maybe take this out a little bit more. And since we've made the gem a bit bigger now, we can add some more detail to it too. Kind of make it look like it's a bit of a faceted gem. It's a bit dark. When you're making a gem to shine like this, it's a combination of the dark lines and the, and the highlights you make that really, really make it look like it's a shining gem. So often all comes together after you've laid in a little bit of work. Now let's do a bit of a mid-tone. Something around... I think I might want to be more vibrant now. Actually, how about I make this the new mid-highlight. And I get a new colour for the darker blue. Bring it down a bit. A bit more vibrant, I think. Maybe even bit more of a dark blue. As I said, a lot of time it's just um, trial and error. Keep trying things to see if they work. And you can always go back and touch up things which don't go as, as perfectly as planned. See, I'm not super liking how this gem is looking. I can't get to look quite right. And sometimes it can take a good while to get it looking just right. So instead, I think we'll change the design a little bit. 
I'll go back to something slightly more how I plan to start with. Instead of having like a big gem, how about I just have a little crystal? Stick it out and maybe something like that instead. It's a little bit simpler design for how much time we want to spend on this. Obviously we don't have about five hours to spend doing each little part. So sometimes we've got to start again. That's the good thing about pixel art. Sometimes it can be very quick, sometimes it can take a while. You can always change it because you are the artist, it'll look how you want it to look. See, I'm already preferring how this is looking. You know, I might even go to a pure white. It might be better if I just go to like a an aqua highlight kind of. Yeah, I'm liking that. This looks a little bit magical. And you could even give a little bit of a implying that kind of like the light is shining onto the wood. There's emanating light. And you can always have like some kind of like arcane patterns going down the staff. Now I'm trying to create symbols like this. I, we don't have too much space to work with, so I kind of just do random lines, not think too much about it, and the eye kind of just uh, builds them up. Let's go to a tone that's a little bit darker. Something like that. I kind of quite like how that's looking all magical. You could even, if you're animating it, have some kind of like a wispy like particle effects going around it. Just to really sell perhaps the elements for maybe this is like a water staff perhaps. You could have it all flowing around it like water. Or if it's fire staff, you could have like sparks going around it. Something like that. Just to sell the magic in the world. Because art is, after all, about telling a story. Okay, I like those effects. So now, let's finish the staff. Because you don't want too much attention to be brought away from the magical effect. So, first of all, I'm going to make sure I can't draw on the outside of that. Just some nice muted colours. And just give it a bit of a bit of a shadow. So the last thing I want is this taking away from the design as a whole. Obviously I said about wood, just adding little little bits of randomness. It sells the impression of wood. I think, that, I think that works. Because you could add another highlight on there. But I think with, with all the detail being focused at the top, we don't want the eye to be drawn too far away from that. And likewise, for the smaller sizes, it'd be similar. For the um, 64 by 64, it would just be this, but smaller. We've still got enough pixels that we could do some cool design there. When we get into these sizes is where Perhaps if we are doing animation, that might be more helpful for telling us the story. So this size, you kind of got to simplify it quite a lot. Even the particle effects kind of be like one or two pixels now. See, I think the best way to sell this at this scale would be in the animation and play like the effects of um, when we do attacks and stuff. Obviously the rest of the attire will help sell the image too. So 
Something like that, maybe. And again, this goes even more so the smaller you go. Here, you would just have like one little thing. And at this point, it's literally just two pixels. Or oh, actually, if there's a wizard, I'll probably do the staff go in, play vertical, something like that, with the effects on it. But in this, case, in, in this size, it's especially important that it's told uh, through maybe the clothing, the attacks, stuff like that. Because you can't get enough detail in there for, to show it clearly. Awesome. So that is how you could perhaps draw a wizard staff. Obviously, when we we'll talk about animation later, this could be something fun to go back to and give an example of. But for now, we're going to go into something a, bit, a little bit more modern. So we know might do if you're doing a more... Um, a game or something that's set in the real world, modern times. Things are like guns. Uh, uh, you could think of Metal Slug as an example of a pixel-like game with guns. Stuff like that, Contra, all sorts. Um, so yeah, that's what we'll be looking at in the next section. Hey there! Congratulations on completing this free three-hour pixel art essentials tutorial. It's a pretty great achievement and I hope that you have enjoyed it. You are now ready to get started on creating some cool art. If you would like to uncover all the hidden tricks and learn how to draw better pixel art, head to skilladamia.com. The beginner to advanced course consists of many more hours of exercises and demos drawn on screen which will turn you into a pro in no time. You'll be able to learn more about how to draw different characters, animations, portraits and backgrounds, as well as how to draw for different types of games. If this sounds like something you want, go check it out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.